logic. What is it? If you have taken philosophy in a logic class, you can go to sleep for a few minutes. I'll tell you when to wake up. Yeah. Um, if you've taken deductive logic. Yeah. And let me be very clear here. This, the study of logic is, is like a lifetime thing. Uh, people really do spend a lifetime doing this. Um, you're going to get something really very superficial here. Okay, basic intro to very basic ideas behind logic. Um, but it'll get you started. It'll give you a taste. All right. Generally speaking, we talk about two types of logic, deductive and inductive. I'll give you a minute to write this slide down, since I'm guessing you want to write it down. Okay, as it says, deductive goes from the general to the particular. In this example, let's assume it's true that all trees have green leaves. I know it's not, but let's assume that. And therefore, if that thing is a tree, then it has green leaves. That's deductive logic. That's what most people think of when we think of logic, right? from the general to the particular. It can go the other way. I could look out the window here and say, I see eight trees. They all have green leaves. Therefore, it's possible that all trees have green leaves. Deductive logic takes you to, if you do it right, if your premise, all trees have green leaves, and your, that's your major premise, and your minor premise, that thing is a tree, if those are both true, then your conclusion has to be true. Okay, that thing has green leaves. In inductive logic, okay, you come up with what's possible. Okay? doesn't have to be true. And that's why in my conclusion, I said, all trees might have green leaves. In inductive logic, you're not getting to the truth. There are a lot of logicians, people who study logic, who don't even think inductive logic is logic. Okay, they'll tell you the only logic is deductive logic. And that's certainly where we're gonna spend our time today. But I happen to like inductive logic. Um, okay, we see it today. Uh, let's take a moment, look at um, the science going on around COVID-19 right now. Everybody's telling us testing and tracing. Uh, that's inductive logic. Okay. If, I if I come up with COVID-19 uh, and you trace all the people I've been in touch with for the past four days or whatever they're talking about, uh, you're doing that because the end of that logic is those people might be infected. Uh, that's inductive. If a doctor sees three kids with measles and they're all from the same elementary school, 
he might conclude, I think there's an outbreak of measles at that school. That's inductive. And I like it because that's creative thinking. Uh, that's not just deduction from facts. That's coming up with a, a fresh idea, something really interesting. If you look at the scientific method, uh, where does the scientific method start? Anyone remember? Form a hypothesis. Before that? Know what you're trying to experiment. You're getting closer. It starts with observations. It's observation, then hypothesis. That's inductive logic. You observe a bunch of trees, they all have green leaves, you form a hypothesis, all trees might have green leaves. The second part of the scientific method is this. You test that hypothesis, all trees have green leaves. You go out and you check as many trees as you can find. And when you do that, you find out that not all trees have green leaves. Your hypothesis is false. The scientific method involves both of these. I'm just tossing inductive out there. I'm not going to spend any more time on it, um, except to say I like it and it's fun. It's much more fun to me than deductive. And I want you to know it exists. But as I said, mostly we talk about deductive logic. Okay, and here we go. Syllogisms. These are from Aristotle um, in his book Logic. I told you he wrote the textbook on almost everything. Wrote the textbook on logic. Wrote the textbook on public speaking. It's called Rhetoric. You should probably, did I go over that before? I think yes. so. Okay, good, because you should know that. Um, and you have a final coming up. Uh, back to syllogisms here. Syllogisms are to logic what axioms are to math. Does anyone remember axioms? A statement that is generally agreed upon as true. Yeah. It's actually a premise that you have to accept for math to work. Okay. Syllogisms are the same thing in logic. You have to accept them for logic to work. Otherwise, logic falls apart. For instance, in math, an axiom is that the sum of two positive integers is go always going to be greater than either of those integers. Okay. Now, you can write proofs of that all day long. It really doesn't matter because if that's not true, if the sum of 3 plus 4 isn't greater than 3 and greater than 4, math falls apart. It just makes no sense. Okay. Same with these syllogisms. Lots of people have written proofs around them. Again, it hardly matters because logic doesn't exist if they don't. There are lots of syllogisms out there, but we're going to cover the three here that is 90% of logic. Okay. This is going to start to be a brain burn. Turn your, I, I warned you that this class would get uh, more challenging as we went on. Here we go. Going to start with categorical syllogisms. That's in math, that's basically just the transitive property. Yeah, but it's not transitive. I'm coming to that. Yeah. All right, if you are not 
into this sort of symbols over here. Let's talk over here in word problems. Your major premise, yeah. all men are mortal. Yeah. Your minor premise, Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's all it is. That, by the way, is an example straight out of Aristotle. You should probably know it. It pops up from time to time. Yeah. All it's saying is that if a thing belongs in the category, it has the properties of that category. That's it. If all trees have green leaves and that thing is a tree, then it has green leaves. It has the properties, the characteristics of the category. Basic idea here is that categories matter, that they work, that if you put something in a category, it belongs there. Yeah. Sounds pretty easy and it is, except we mess this up all the time. Give you a minute to write that down. You can't flip the terms on this one. It doesn't work. If I say all trees have green leaves, that thing has green leaves, what can you conclude? That thing is a tree and not just a pile of leaves. Actually, no, you can't. If all trees have green leaves and that thing has green leaves, we don't know anything about it except that it has green leaves. We know it's a pile of leaves or a bush or a garland we put in our hair or a centerpiece at a dinner table. It could be a lot of things. And this is the error, the fallacy. Fallacy means error in logic. This is the fallacy that a lot of people make around categorical syllogisms. Instead of saying, if the thing belongs in the category, it has the properties of the category. People will say, if a thing has the properties of the category, then it belongs in the category. And that's not necessarily true. How many of you are tall? Can I have some reaction from all the tall people in the room? <laughs> I'm only five, like five, so I'm not tall. All right. I'm 5'10", so I fit into no groups. Okay. Any tall people here? I'm 6'1", so I don't know. I guess that's all for America, but... Is that Dante? Um, yeah, it's me. Sorry. Okay. Dante's 6'1". Dante's all right, we got one that's sort of tall. Anybody else tall? All right. Dante? Yeah. As, a, as apparently the tallest people person in the room. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. How many times are you asked if you play basketball? Very few. Very few? Yeah. Ah, you're not that tall then. Okay, I don't know where the cutoff is. Um, it's probably around 6'3 or something. Okay. I'm, I met a guy who was 6'10", and I did ask him if he played basketball. He was not on the high school basketball team, which I think should be illegal. <laughs> I'm just saying. What happens here, I mean... My gentleman friend is 6'4", and he's still asked all the time if he plays or ever played basketball. It's stunning. No, he didn't. He was a pitcher, baseball. Um, but that's a prime example of assuming that because somebody has the characteristics of a basketball player, tallness, that they belong in the category basketball player. Uh, how many of you speak Spanish? I'm looking over at the list. 
basically I Dante I speaks Spanish. Jesus. Whoa, 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 whoa. No? I, th- I, I speak Portuguese, not Spanish. Okay, Jesus, though. But, well, uh, yeah, no, I speak a little bit, but only All right, I I, 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 hang on, Sorry. hang on. I'm looking for people who speak Spanish. Jesus, do you speak yeah. Spanish? Did you say you spoke Spanish? Yes, somebody I do. put Somebody put their hand up. I don't know who it was. Disappeared. Ah, Adam. All right. I'm going to ask Jesus since he started all this. I did. Um, you started by, you were the first person to... Oh. Say you spoke Spanish. That's all. Um, how many times are you asked if you or your family come from Mexico? Um, how many times uh, is that assumption made that your family's from Mexico? Uh, quite, quite, uh, quite often. Okay. This is this makes Hondurans and Salvadorans. Very angry. And That's Belizeans. Am, I'm actually only half Mexican, so. <laughs> there you go. And this fallacy works like this. Most people from Mexico speak Spanish. Okay. That person speaks Spanish. Therefore, that person is probably from Mexico. Okay. Absolutely bad logic just because that person has the characteristics of a category called Mexican doesn't mean they're Mexican. And if you've ever met anybody from any of the other Latin American countries or Puerto Rico, I I even have a friend from Spain who gets ticked off because people tell him he must be from Mexico. And, And he speaks Spanish from Spain, not from Mexico. Even I can hear the difference. Uh, he's like, my name is Prado. It's, it's a Spanish, a European name. Uh, um, so this happens all the time. It gets us into big trouble. This, uh, this error in logic is behind most racial profiling. They assume that if a person have the, has the characteristics of a category, they belong in that category. Right, so there you go. Bad logic. Next one up is the hypothetical syllogism. Okay. If categorical syllogisms are about examples, hypothetical syllogisms are about if then construction. I am white, therefore these statements are true. (laughs) Maybe yes, maybe no. My neck is burned right now. This is, this is a cause and effect syllogism. If A co- necessarily causes B and B necessarily causes C, if you have A, you'll have C. And that's just how this one rolls. Have you guys written this down yet? Can I go on? No. 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 All right. Okay. If the sun is shining, then there will be lots of UV rays. 
if there are lots of UV rays, then I will get a sunburn. If the sun is shining, then I will get a sunburn. Okay, pretty simple stuff. If A causes B and B causes C, if you have A, you have C. People mess with this one too, because this statement, if the sun is shining, I will get a sunburn, is not true. What's missing here? If there are lots of UV rays and I go out in the sun without sunscreen, then I will get a sunburn. There you go, exactly. I mean, the oh. sun is shining right now, right? Also, it never said that you go outside. It doesn't, so, but you have to say, you have to include, and I'm exposed to the UV rays. It has to be in there for this to be a true statement. Like I said, I think, I can't see a window from here, but I think it's, it's the sun's out, right? Yeah. Yeah. I am not sitting here getting a sunburn. In other words, the sun is shining. I am not getting a sunburn. The problem here is what's called the missing middle. On the one hand, this is a really useful shorthand for a lot of things. We skip the stuff in the middle. We say things like, if I turn my key in the ignition, the car will start. If then construction. And all sorts of things have to happen between turning your key in the ignition and the car starting. But it's a really nice, handy way to shortcut that whole thing and just jump from the beginning to the end. But people mess you up by eliminating some of the things that have to be true in the middle. For instance, uh, I'm guessing many of you have people in your family who've said to you, if you go to college, you'll be successful. Heard that? Yeah. Something like that. You know that's not true, right? Yeah. Nope. Yeah, because it, yeah. Never, it never said you finished college, never said you did well in college, it never said that you would be majoring in something that would be hireable, it, never, it didn't say a lot of things. A lot of things that you have to have connections, that you have to, you know, I mean, yes, lots of things. Those are all missing middles. And, and, and we intuitively get that most of the time. Some relative says to you, if you go to college, you'll be successful. And the, there's an immediate check mark there in your head going, yeah, right. Huh? That's because this stuff in the middle is missing. <clears throat> you know, if you save your money, you'll be rich. Really? Uh, all of those that jump from a beginning to an end point, check the middle. There are pieces missing. That's the hypothetical syllogism. I'm going to get to one more today, the last of them, the last of the syllogisms. If, the, if you can't have A or B at the same time, <coughs> if you have A, then you can't have B, and if you have B, you can't have A. The construction here is either or.
got this or you need another minute? I'm okay. Okay. All right. Either A or B. The elephant is either in the room or she's outside. The elephant is outside and she's not in the room. In this case, the elephant is inside and she's not outside. This was all prompted by this photoshopped picture of the elephant in the room, which mm -hmm. I just happened to like at that moment. Um, again, very simple stuff. I'll draw, I'll draw you a little Venn diagram of what this looks like. There, there's a Venn diagram. It's what's called mutually exclusive. It means there's no overlap in the two things. There are no common points. If the two things are mutually exclusive, it's either wet or dry. For instance, if it's wet, then it's not dry. If it's dry, then it's not wet. Okay. I don't think that these these concepts are really this easy. Okay. They're very basic. Syllogisms are very basic. And we still mess them up. People will give you an either or option when there is overlap, okay. is the statement true that the elephant is either in the room or she's outside? Are those the two possible conditions? No. What's, the, what's another condition? Well, the elephant could be somewhere else in a cage or zoo or something. Oh, it's, she's either in the, in the room or she's outside the room. But I can still think of a, a way this doesn't work. Doesn't exist. What if she's in the doorway? Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And people do this, make this mistake all the time too, or they try to manipulate you with either or options. 